comes to performance and hypervisors, there is a certain theme that I think uh, I, I think hounds most administrators and developers. Uh, it's pretty safe to say that everyone in this room have had to deal with this at some point, and no one liked it. And just in case you're wondering, I'm not talking about disclaimers. Um, th this one you can read it later at your own time. I'm talking about performance overhead. And I'm gonna tell you what really freaks me out about performance overhead, and that's when someone makes a broad statement like version A is 25% slower, maybe five times faster than version B. Sometimes I actually put a graph, but a couple of bars with an arrow. And when it comes to performance overhead, the, the simple truth is that there isn't a one-size-fit-all rule. You don't know how your product is gonna be used by certain workloads, and you don't know uh, in which platforms you're gonna be used a lot of the time. And that just means that maybe changes you do in software may affect um, your workloads differently. Maybe it affects it all positively by, by different orders. If we talk just in terms of storage performance, uh, and if you worked with storage performance before, you're probably familiar with elements like reads or writes or mixing them up with requests of different size, sequential, random, uh, maybe queue depth, which could involve requests being submitted as a batch from one or many CPUs in um, uh, perhaps a combination of these. And just these alone, it's probably fair to say that the practical combinations are infinite. And depending on what you're doing, things will be affected differently. There are some other uh, non-obvious parameters when it comes to this. I'll mention a couple of uh, in interesting ones. One is temperature. And there is this uh, paper from 2012 called Some Like It Hot, um, where they took some non-enterprise SATA drives and started to heat them up while they benchmarked them. And they would perform a lot better the hotter they got. Of course, up to the point where they caught on fire and stopped performing. Um, there is another link of, uh, on YouTube, a lot of people have seen this, of this guy that goes in the data center and shouts at his disks. And by doing that, some latency benchmark just shows all sorts of spikes. So think about it, you have your rack, same software, same hardware, you move it closer to the AC unit, and it performs one way because it's cooler, perhaps differently because it's louder, right? It's too hard. So, what I'm going to talk today is I'm going to talk about how I measure storage performance, focusing on analyzing hypervisor overhead. And then we're going to do exactly that. We're going to go on and analyze a couple of hypervisors. Um, and don't be fooled. There's a lot of content here. I hope you are up for it. I will try to conclude with some thoughts and maybe some extras if you're not dead by the time we get there. So storage metrics. There is a few metrics that are very, very popular. I, I think everyone has heard of throughput, IOPS, latency. And if we look at this, they, they look almost like they're measuring the same thing in a way, right? Everything is about moving some data over some sort of unit of time, maybe how much time passes while we're moving some data. Uh, and when I ask this question, the most popular answer I get is, throughput is to measure sequential I.O. IOPS is to measure random I.O. Uh, perhaps latency is to measure the time for single request completion. I, I don't think any of these answers are wrong, but they are far from complete. We're going to focus today on throughput and IOPS only. And I'm going to start with throughput. And there's a sample, sample graph, it's not real measurements on that. Uh, the idea is that you care about throughput when you care about how much volume of data you can move. So let's say you are familiar with the access pattern of the data which means you could then lay out your data sequentially if you know how it's gonna be read. That's why throughput ends up associated with sequential I.O. Think a streaming service. You're gonna read a lot of data from the disk and then transmit it off um, of the network or something. If, um, if you know um, how the data is gonna be accessed, you lay sequentially, it may help mechanical drives and other uh, sorts of storage. Now, what you control then, it's how much data you can read, the request size. So what I do with throughput is I plot a graph with, which has uh, the metric you have on the y-axis. So throughput, linear scale, always start your graphs at zero on the y-axis, uh, and megabytes a second, for example. And on the x-axis, the variable I can control, which is the block size. I will start with a sector, 512 bytes, maybe 4K, and I'll grow that in powers of two so that you have a, a log scale. And normally what you get is some sort of curve. Then depending on the results of this curve, I decide how to proceed from there. So I always start with Q depth one and one thread. So let's move to some real graphs to see what that looks like. Um, what I have here are Intel Optane SSDs. So these are those NVMe drives with 3D cross-point media. 
And I took four of them and I put them together on a um, RAID 0 array with the kernel MD driver. And I've used Debian 10 across this presentation. So it's my favorite distro, sort of lightweight. Doesn't have a lot of things running there. Um, unfortunately, kernel is still 4, 4.19, but it's still 4, which means no IOU ring this year. Um, and we're looking at random reads. So despite measuring throughput, I'm doing random reads because I want to avoid any sort of read ahead by the device. And we can see the curve there. Um, we can see that things got a lot faster when I started uh, transversing that stripe uh, limitation of my RAID, or, or the stripe size of my RAID. But it almost feels like that if I could throw larger requests to this, it would go even faster. So what I do at that point is I bump the queue depth of that thread. And I can see that with one thread, queue depth two, I could actually get to a point where it looks like my curve saturated. It's just over 10 gigabytes a second. And looking at the spec of these drives, uh, perhaps they do two and a half gigabytes each, that looks about right. But there's a big gap between one and two. So I go there and I throw some more requests at it. And um, we see that the performance got a lot better, but only with a certain request size. So as a matter of fact, if you focus on the 8K or maybe the 4K here, you see that after queue depth four, the performance didn't really grow that much. <laughs> So what happened here is that we're saturating on CPU. This is something that a lot of people don't uh, think that happens. You don't really saturate on CPU when you're measuring throughput. Yeah, you do, especially with this kind of media that is very low latency. So this, this is what's happening behind the scenes, the simplification of it. But you can think that with time moving forwards, we have that blue box, which is the amount of time you're spending on the CPU, take, preparing the request and sending it to the disk. Then the, the very top there, you have the red bar moving, which is the time spent on the device. There's a completion. You send the next request, QDEF1, right? One outstanding at a time. So if you're looking at things like top, IOSTAT, you're maybe seeing CPU utilization at 20%, disk utilization at 80%. Now, the thing about modern SSDs is that they are very parallel. So if you start submitting a second request after, after you submit the first, the latency per request doesn't really grow much. Um, which means the drive is far from saturated, even though it appears to be 100% utilized. And you can keep doing that up to the point your application may be thinking that it's submitting 32 uh, outstanding requests at a time from that one thread. But the reality is that when you submit that fifth request, maybe the first one has completed. So as far as the drive is concerned, you you don't have that many requests outstanding because it's doing its job very quickly, but your CPU is 100% busy. CPU is not that parallel, not a single core. So if we go back to this, this graph, and instead of doing one thread with 32 outstanding requests, I'm gonna change it to do 32 threads with one outstanding request each. These have been pinned to the NUMA node of this drive and only to the eight cores, not all the hyper threads. And that's what I got. So there are ton of things to discuss here. Uh, let's just focus on the 4 and 8K requests. You can see how we go from here to there. So just by using more threads. Again, the importance of plotting graphs. That's something I want to stress through all this presentation. That measuring comprehensively everything you have and trying to plot there will really help. You can throw other things on the graph, CPU utilization, et cetera. It'll help you to understand what's happening behind the scenes. So when we focus on the 4K and the 8K, we see that what we were really limiting ourselves was how many requests we could complete. And that brings us to IOPS. So IOPS is associated with random I.O. because you normally care about completing lots of requests. And you care about completing lots of requests when those requests are perhaps small. So before I mention a streaming service, think that now we have a database and we need to read a small index somewhere before we can go on and read uh, another part of our table somewhere else. But maybe this is part of a transaction and we have lots of users, so we have lots of these transactions happening at a time. Uh, what I control now then is how many users perhaps I want to support, how many of these uh, transactions I want to do at a time. So the way we look at the graph now would be still metric on the y-axis, which is IOPS, and the queue depth on the x-axis. And then you fix the request size. So for example, 4 or 8K are popular uh, numbers. 4K is very popular thing for storage vendors, AK perhaps by database benchmarks, it depends. So now because you're very likely to bottleneck on CPU, what you wanna do is use more threads over more cores for, for your different series. So let's go back to my um, four uh, NVMe drives in the RAID array. 
and we see that even though each one of these drives can do 600,000 IOPS, um, and there were infamous devices that are much faster than that, it's a combination of what cube depth do you need to get there, or, or how does it take the load, or what submission interface you're using, there's a number of, of, of things that come into play here. Um, what I'm doing here is just going all the way to cube depth 64 with one thread, and you see that we are perhaps at a, just shy of 300,000 IOPS. So, not that great, maybe half of what one drive can do. But if we start using more threads and more cores, then we do get to some better number. So what we have at the top there is 16 threads still pinned to this uh, eight cores with QDEF one each. Of course, as I said earlier, the number of combinations are crazy. You could have been trying eight threads uh, with QDEF two, probably be very similar, maybe a bit faster. Um, the important thing to remember is that we have this top curve here that delimits what kind of speed we can get with this submission interface, uh, with the CPU models. So if your CPUs are faster, this is probably gonna be better. If they're slower, it's definitely gonna be worse. So depending on your package, if you have more cores but slower, everything is different. And uh, that the peak there is probably around 2.2 million IOPS for this model. So, okay, so now we know how to look at throughput. We know how to look at IOPS. Let's have some fun analyzing hypervisors. So before I actually dive into any hypervisor, I wanted to spend some time on a graph that I, I've made a long, long time ago. This is many years ago. And I've redid this measure recently. But it was the graph that helped me to understand virtualization overhead. And I don't quite remember. I think this is Debian 9. Uh, the, the host is one of our uh, old AHV versions. Um, the guess was Debian 9. But what we're looking at here is just a bare metal measurement of throughput. Uh, on a mechanical drive that with, Q, with request sizes of maybe 16 or 32K, we can pick the drive at 115 megabytes a second. And then the larger requests you send, just the latency is just doubling, right? So the throughput is the same. And what do you think happens if we just virtualize this, this drive to a VM and measure again? How does that graph look like? And before doing that, I never really plotted this graph, so I was just, uh, I mean, before this is the first time, and I would just go perhaps and measure 32K and one megabyte IO, sequential, buffered, maybe the older act, which is what many benchmarks out there will do. And that doesn't give you the complete, complete picture. You do need the graphs. And that's what it looks like. So someone who is just looking at 32K or a megabyte would say, oh, there's no overhead. Uh, but someone just doing a QDEF1 of 4K would see some overhead. So the fact is that with those small requests, this drive, is perhaps, uh, this drive is perhaps answering with a few microseconds latency, but at a megabyte, the latency is about 10 milliseconds. So those extra microseconds of the device are invisible, or at least very hard to measure. So of course, then now that we're talking about um, 3D cross-point media that can answer requests in like five microseconds, anything counts, right? And with that, we can go and have some fun with our first hypervisor. So all of this was measured on Debian 10 as is, uh, apt install QMU and uh, apt install libvirt and go take it from there. And I took that big RAID array and I passed it to the VM as one video disk only. So we really want to make it challenging for the VM, for the, for the hypervisor, right? So what's happening uh, here? I have my host at the bottom with uh, QMU do, talking with uh, libio to, to the block layer. And the VM with FIO in there, talking with libio to the Vario block driver that reached that block device that's being virtualized. And that disk at the bottom is my big RAID array. So uh, one of the things that I want to, to mention just now is when you configure like this, QMU will have one IO thread for that device. And you can have more IO threads if you have more virtual devices. And that, that, that was, um, that combined, with that virtual device being multi-queue, made things a lot better based on old measurements I had for QMU. So the fact that the, 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 the gas device has multiple queues means that the workload in the gas when it's running from multiple CPUs can actually access all those queues in parallel without lock contention, and things are generally much faster. But we have a problem of all those queues being driven by only one uh, thread on the whole side. And that bottlenecks, as we're going to see in the graphs. So one of the things we did with our hypervisor in Nutanix is allow uh, our Vorteil SCSI controller to have multiple keys 
which are driven by different threads. So QEMU has seen a lot of that's outside of, of, uh, outside of QEMU using Vuehost. So QEMU has had some incredible work done in the recent years. It would really be great to see someone just picking that up and fixing um, my volunteering uh, to, to have different I.O. threads that can drive the different queues. So the idea is you could have an I.O. thread and perhaps the VQ0 of each one of those drives can go there. You can shard them and, and get better um, CPU utilization model there. Right, so throughput. That's what I got from the host, the, the highest line, with uh, 32 threads. And now we're going to go inside a VM and measure that with one thread. And that's just one thread. It's not fair to, to, to say that things are really bad, right? So let's throw some more threads in the VM there. And that's eight threads in the VM. It was actually quite good with, I think, maybe six or seven we got there uh, with certain block sizes. And that did over 10 gigabytes a second. It's pretty good. So let's throw some more. So 16 threads. Things have still improved a bit. 32 threads. It's still improved a bit. 64 threads. It's even better than the 32 for, for a few request sizes there from a VM, right? So, of course, again, not fair, because on the whole side, there's only one thread doing I.O. And if you remember the measurements I showed at the very beginning with just one thread doing I.O. of this disk with a high Q depth, that's probably not that dissimilar from this. So there is some measurable overhead, which means that you need more Q depth to get there, eventually get there. If you had more virtual disks, you could probably close this big gap between the colorful lines and the black baseline because you would have more I.O. threads. What about IOPS? That's, that's a beast, right? IOPS is probably, at this rate, one of the hardest uh, metrics to meet. And if you run one thread in the VM, it's actually not that bad. It's quite close to what it was in bare metal. That was just under 300,000 IOPS. This is just under 250. But if you throw more threads in the VM, you can't really see it, can you? It's just all behind the purple line because we're just completely bottlenecked on that single I.O. thread. Now you can see a disappointed user that paid for 2.2 million of IOPS and got 250K. Again, not fair. You could do a lot better on KMU if you had more virtual disks. And as long as this Q modeling is sorted, it's, it's going to eventually get there. So the next hypervisor I played with was Zen, our friends. Um, so again, apt install Zen and set the same VDisk up with block front and block back. So on Zen, things are very, very different. Um, on the, uh, the Zen has this bus that you can present the device to the, the front end, to the VMs. They have a this driver that will pick it up and set up a block device that then has some shared memory with, with the control domain for that disk, in my case here, DOM0. And on the DOM0 side, there is one very interesting thing. Everything is in the kernel. So I'm not saying that everything being in the kernel is good or that everything being in the space is good. I'm saying that the context switch is horrible. So if you were here on Monday and you watch Greg's talk on, on security mitigations, you know that every time context switch, things get even more expensive. So Blockback got this right um, with one Zen. Everything is one side. They will pick up the request from the front end and hand it over directly to the block layer. The other thing Zen got right is the queuing model. So Blockback, we have a thread for each one of the VQs for this device. That allows you to do a lot of things in parallel. But there are some things that are still lagging behind. Um, the ring model is very, very old. It predates things that could do hundreds of thousands of IOPS. And a single ring can only, do, can only hold 32 uh, requests unless you go there and set up multi-page rings that could do more. And each request can only have 44K of data. So the payload per request is really small unless you're using direct descriptors, which I actually believe these days is the default. Um, and then each request can be bigger. So. The, the, the final problem with Zen is that it tends to be very security oriented with everything. And the front driver actually, the front end driver actually works not by passing the pages or, or the frame numbers for where the payload of the request is, but the front end driver will make a hyper call, register the memory you want to do I.O., then take a key back and put that key on the rings. And then on the back end, it needs to make another hyper call to map that key into memory and then do I.O. into that memory. And when it's done, it needs to unmap it, which if for any reason results in TLB shootdowns is even more expensive. Um, so that's something that perhaps needs to be reviewed. Um, I don't want to throw numbers out there, but I would guess that the majority of, of any kind of uh, virtualization environment that is not perhaps dedicated to something super secure doesn't really need that level of protection. Let's see what happens on graphs, right? Graphs. 
Did I say graphs already? Throughput by host baseline, one thread in the VM with blockback. That's actually quite good. It's interesting to see how it scales, a bit different than what I would expect, but quite fast for QDAF1. With QDAF4, it actually gets to the, um, the peak of, the, of, of what I can do in terms of throughput. But something very interesting happens with QDAF5. And as you can see there, for the very large request, the perform actually goes down. Again, the importance of graphs. If you're not having the full line, you wouldn't see that story. And that's even more noticeable as you keep bumping the QDAF that there is some sort of contention going on there and cause the performance to tank. And to the best of my knowledge, that's down to grand contention and, and grand map problems. I have see people nodding. Uh, so yeah, I'm not too off here. And when you have that volume of data, that volume of requests flying around, this model just doesn't hold. What about um, IOPS? So this was quite surprising for me, actually. I was, uh, okay, QDAF1, I was expecting something about that. But because of the multi-Q model, I was hoping that with, um, um, I was hoping that with more threads in the gas doing IO, that the more threads on the back end would scale, but they didn't really scale that much. And, my guess here is again, my money is on grant. It's just a very high volume of requests that the backend needs to keep mapping and unmapping. There is something called persistent grants, which means to, if possible, the, the two domains will reuse the grants where applicable, but sometimes th that just doesn't um, do what you want or it requires the front end to bounce some data. I'm actually not entirely sure what's the latest state there. I did reach out to, to people in the Zen community about my results, and um, they are helping to look into it and, and maybe um, find potential low-hanging fruits here. Okay, so we looked at the Zen, we looked at KVM, we QMU, and then we blocked back. What can we conclude out of this? What thoughts do we have? And what extra do I have in store? So I think everyone can agree that low latency, high throughput devices are really hard to virtualize. There is uh, no questions there, especially metrics like IOPS. And um, the traditional data, data paths that we've been using to the kernel probably need to be reviewed. Um, using system calls with uh, LibIO, et cetera, is, is just very inefficient. And if you remember the graph I had with the blue boxes, it's not just about if something is inefficient, it's a little bit slower. It's not just about the blue box being a little bit bigger. It's also that you're saturating your CPU sooner, which means you need a lot more course to do the work. So using more efficient data paths is about making that blue box smaller so that not only you can serve requests faster, but you can actually get much better performance per core. So what I have to say about the KVM QMU model, um, great things. Like emulators have direct access to memory. This is not any less secure. There are many other ways you can uh, provide isolation for the emulator and you're fine. Um, that's what I would recommend to Zen just in a minute. And Verdeo MQ, it's a great protocol. It's seen a lot of improvement, and we just saw that. And it works really, really well. It's very parallel. We can do things very well. Uh, I would just not rule out looking at what NVMe does. NVMe was a block protocol designed specifically for, for this level of high performance. So everything is optimized in the sense of reducing the number of memory access the device has to do, uh, improving things like batching, et cetera. And I'm not saying you have to ditch one for the other, I'm saying we have to look at both and decide how can we make use of the most recent work that's been doing. There's a lot of people in the industry working on that. Right, then Zen, um, it is, as I just said, too focused on security for its own good. Maybe the defaults should be different. Uh, there are problems with the ring format that should probably be revi revisited. And the efficiency of the grand model really is, is a performance killer. So. What are my thoughts on this? Can hypervisors be more efficient? Um, the first thing I already said is many times today, just avoid this legacy data path. I mean, with kernel 5.1, really look into I.O. Ring and how you can get into the kernel more efficiently. And the whole idea is that you're sharing some memory with the kernel. You can populate a bunch of requests in a ring and then send a notification or maybe tell your kernel to pull um, if, if that works in the setup you have. And this will drastically improve everything. The other thing is looking at models like SPDK, which are user space drivers that can actually do a lot more than just uh, getting to the device quicker. The whole idea there is that you can keep cores awake and pulling and, um, and do, do the blue boxes, make the blue boxes much, much, much smaller. So which brings me to my second thing, 
which is one option is hardware offloads. And there are many things you can do there with Vertio devices, with smart NICs, um, that may help. But they are not a magic solution. You still have some um, time you're going to spend into getting the device, device accessing memory, etc. You're going to save a lot of CPU. That's unquestionable. But um, it, we have to, to really start measuring this, perhaps with more comprehensive uh, metrics and benchmarks, and figure out if that does what we wanted to do. So the other option we have is software host polling, which we've been doing, um, um, uh, as, as I'm going to show you, works really, really well. So the idea there is that you have one process on the host that is responsible for all of your VMs, or perhaps for a set of VMs, let's say a tenant in your host. And you may have a thread, or you may have more threads, depending on, on what you need. And um, the, straight out of the box, because the hypervisor will be polling, the VMs don't need to kick you anymore. So you can disable the kicks from the VMs. And that will save on VM exits, which makes things more efficient in general, save, save CPU times for the vCPUs. And the other thing is because you're spinning and perhaps you're driving the devices straight away, you can throw requests at the device and spin on the devices too, which means the devices don't need to send RQs to the host. Right? So that's exactly what I saved for extras. It's the same model we had before but using SPDK's vhost user block model, and actually taking a step even further and using SPDK in the guest too. So if we start top to bottom, we have an SPDK application in the guest, which there are many applications on there that started using this. I don't want to be naming any of them, but they, they are serious. You, you can look at the SPDK Summit participants and figure out. And I, I believe there will be more and more workloads out there they will be capable of just driving the devices that are presented to the virtual machine straight away. And they don't have to be in VME. This PDK has drivers for many other things. In this example, I'm using a vertical block driver. So the idea is that my application user space can directly talk to the vertical block device and not only configure the device, et cetera, but also drive its request queues. Then on the whole side, we have the SPDK uh, vhost target using the vhost user uh, block backend to spin on the submission queues of the VM, which means the VM doesn't uh, need to kick me. But most importantly, the VM is also spinning, which means I don't have to RQ the VM. And you'd be surprised how much time you save by not having the co-event of the write. And then on the downstream here, we have the NVMe driver code inside uh, SPDK, which is directly talking to those, those four drives with a RAID 0 driver with 64K stripes, just like before. So I want to guess what the performance looked like for that one. So before we actually measure the VM performance, to be completely fair, I, I made a new baseline. So this is a baseline by just measuring SPDK performance directly on its own implementation of a RAID 0. And QDEATH 1 is like this. So you can see, again, as expected, 128 requests and higher is very, very fast. And up to QDEATH 8 looks like that. And based on the gradient, uh, of the curves you could see could even get faster. So just one thing that I mentioned in case you didn't notice, I said QDEF8. This is still just one thread in the whole student I.O. And QDEF16 and QDEF32. So with one thread talking directly to these four devices, we can actually do a lot better than we could do with those 32 threads over eight cores that we had before. This is the difference that it makes when you're bypassing LibAIO. Right? I don't have any measurements I said with IOU ring. I expect it to be comparable. But SPDK cuts the kernel from the data path altogether, which I would expect it to be faster. So if we take just the three lines here, QDEF 8, 16, and 32, from the baseline, and now we go to the VM and we repeat the same measurement, let's see what we get. So with one thread in the VM, QDEF 8, I almost meet the baseline. So the overhead now is the distance between the thin black line for QDF8 and the thick black line there. There's almost nothing. Still measurable, but very, very low. With um, QDF16 from the VM, again, almost the same. For 4K, a little bit higher than everything else. And for 32K, again, almost the same. So instead of using all those vCPUs in the guest and all those vCPUs in the host, something like this, you're using one thread in the guest and one thread in the host. What about IOPS? That's the challenging one, right? That's been the beast in the room so far. We can't get there from a VM. So let's first look at a baseline. 
what can SPDK do with um, one thread? That's it. So we don't need the eight cores and the 32 threads, or 16 threads I had before, sorry. Uh, one thread can really get you way better than before. And inside SPDK, that's actually transversing the, um, the it's what's called the BDEV layer, which is what implements the RAID 0. So it may be possible to do better if you're directly using its NVMe functions. So if that's the, the benchmark, the, oh, sorry, the baseline, what does it look like from the VM? With one thread in the VM and varying the queue depth, that's what you get. We could actually get to over 2 million IOPS, not quite there. Maybe if you threw another core in the mix, it would be better, but I didn't want to uh, cheat, right? As far as it gets. There is a glitch there. It's very reproducible, and I did report to them, and they're looking into it. And we'll see um, what we get. So I wanted to leave you with this graph and showing that it is possible to have software implementations which are very efficient and um, very high performance and low latency, even for the most challenging of workloads, um, without having to, to resort to anything that's not available right now. But I think most importantly, the key thing to remember is that this is not a competition. All of the solutions are out there, and this is all open source, and we should just look at each other's failures and successes and figure out what some projects are doing right, other projects are doing wrong, and perhaps where they failed and succeeded later, and incorporate that in all of our products, right? It's, it's, it's about people choose products and, and hypervisors for various reasons, not just for one little thing. Let's just use this kind of venue, this kind of space, this kind of results, everything we have at our disposal to make all of our products better to our users. And with that, thank you, and I'll take questions. Uh, did you also experience with NVDIM, either real or emulated? Thanks for the question. Uh, no. So all, all I'm doing here is taking uh, this for obtained drives and uh, virtualize them to the VMs, which is already challenging enough. I think my personal opinion on how NVDIM should be looked at is that, sure, we should try to figure out if presenting it as just virtual block devices makes sense to the VMs, or if maybe we need to figure out how to do some sort of virtualization and pass through to the VM so that VMs themselves can then figure out how to use uh, the devices. So of course there are challenges there to do with things like live migration, etc. But now we're not talking about five microseconds anymore. We're talking about nanoseconds and, and byte addressable things, which is it's a whole complete monster, right? Yeah, okay. I don't explain really well, or no one understood anything. Uh, so one, one aspect you were talking a little bit about um, is trying to eliminate interrupts, and notably IPIs. Is there um, any benefit in trying to, basically using CPUs that are already parked, or already VM exited, or anything, basically right. having a, a set of flags across your hypervisor telling this CPU could actually take an IO right now. Right. The question is along the lines of, can I do interrupt distribution better, right? And I would take you back to my first slide where I talked about, um, about I'm not going to pull it up, but about the different elements of storage performance. An interrupt distribution is something incredibly complicated. I'll, I'll just give you a couple of points. For example, if, if your CPU is not saturated, so if you're not running 100% of the time and already doing things like reaping completions before going to sleep, it's probably true that you need as much CPU time as possible to throw the request at the device if you're trying to, to get better, right? But if you do go to sleep, then that means you may go down to a deeper C state, and that will take you even more time to wake up when, um, when, when you do get an interrupt. So if the interrupts are being delivered to the same core that is submitting the I.O., it is usually the case that if you have time to take the interrupt, so if, if you are actually going to sleep for a little bit, the interrupt takes you up and you get it again, the performance is better. But if you are saturated and you're running 100%, it's usually true that it's better if the CPU arrives somewhere else and just sends you an IPI, 
because then it, the, the interrupt handler doesn't take time away from your application actually going on submitting requests. Now, the caveat there is that you don't want that other core, I said other core, you don't want that other core to be your sibling hyper threat because that's catastrophic for some reason. So there are so many different elements that, that I think would be really hard to figure out some automated way of distributed interrupts. And uh, as it stands, I'm in favor of eliminating interrupts altogether in this case. <coughs> when possible. On, uh, on slide 15, the measuring storage performance, there was some... Which slide? 15. Okay. Oh, and complete the animation. Okay, sorry. How do I do that? There we go. There was some marginal uh, improvement after the, the, the number of threads surpassed the number of CPUs. Can you explain that? Good question. And you might have just explained that, but... Uh, are you talking about the the corner bits here? No, and the, the the you're saying when oh the so upper right I have quadrant pinned the on this particular measurement, I have pinned uh, these threads to the NUMA node, just to the cores eight to fifteen of this NUMA node. So I don't know exactly how the threads were being scheduled over scheduled over this course. What I do know is that depending on where the CPUs are, or that there are queues are coming back, the scheduler may decide to move these threads around, and that makes it pathologically bad in certain cases. So sometimes it's true that if you do this measurement and you just leave the threads free to roam, that's really bad. And if you pin them to a specific course, that's much better. I didn't go to the trouble to do that. I'm not sure. Uh, I see. Are you saying that when two to three or, or no, no, no? When you go from uh, eight to nine, you don't have another CPU, but you get more performance. So again, I could already be overall different cores at that point. I was not uh, pinning it like that. So um, are you talking about the very high end then? Yes. So it's probably true that if I went all the way to 128 and maybe through more cores, and this would be slightly better than it is. It almost feels, again, like it didn't really saturate at the top. This, this looks, satu looks like saturation, right? That at the top doesn't quite look like. I stopped there because I thought it's sufficient, and if you do go to 128, it does look very awkward when you are then taking these two VMs that can only do a little bit and stop. Um, I, at that point, we're approaching the limits of the hardware as well, which is 600,000 for drive, each drive which is 2.4 million in total. So uh, it's, it's not what you described. They are free to roam all over all the cores. I'm not entirely sure uh, how the gradient stops. So uh, one thing to note here, maybe to clarify, this is the effective queue depth, which is why you have less data points going up. So take, for example, the orange line. You're only going to have uh, a data point every four because I have four threads with queue depth one and then four threads with QDEF uh, 2, which is actually 8. Does that make sense? So that's, that's why the points get more scarce, and perhaps at the very top, the graph looks a little bit difficult to read, and it would be easier, perhaps, if you keep measuring this to much higher QDEFs. There is a copy of the slides on shed.com, and I'm more than happy to send you the raw data, or for anyone that wants, just drop in e me an email. Yeah, so I, I was wondering about the front end and back end protocols. So the, the so the both so the front end is Vertio block. Um, the uh, which one? The QM the, the QM SPDK. One? The SPDK. The SPDK one. So you want to talk about this one here? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So the, okay. So it's Vertio block, and the back the back end is a is a is a is a hard drive. So hard drive. the this this green box oh, here says SPDK. So the way this works is QMU sets up the device. And using the vhost user protocol, it offloads the data path of this device to another application via a Unix socket, sure. which is that blue box that then drives the front end. Yeah, I was, I was wondering whether you compared like Vertio 1.0 to 1.1 or between oh, that uh, and that. Uh, I believe this is Vertio 1.0. Uh, 
we have Chen Peng here from the SPDK team, and uh, he may be able to come in further. 1.0. 1. 1. It's 1.0. 1. I'm just be interested to see if it improves if you go to 1.1 or go to NVMe. Um, sure, that can be looked into. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, um, since we have a minute left, just some entertaining facts. Uh, <laughs> proven, right? <laughs> Temperature and mass. This graphs, these slides are really, really old. I just found them recently. This one, it's really, really old. Some old Zen server measurement. And with the fans of the chassis at full speed, went to this, right? Can see it. That's one of my favorites, presented on a Zen Summit a long time ago. Red line is DOM0, green line is the VM. So it gets faster. <laughs> so again, this was very early days of NVMe. We were working on a Micron drive that didn't really follow the NVMe spec. But those drives are really highly parallel. And the Zen ring protocol, as I said, is not that good. So when you have very big requests, that ends up split up. And now you have parallel requests that are smaller. So the VM actually, the hypervisor mangled the request into splitting them up into smaller ones, made things faster. It, it, I actually wrote an LD preload library that would take reads and write requests and split them up into small ones, test, and you can prove that uh, 8 or 64Q that with 8K is much faster than the equivalent of a single request is 512K or something. There's interesting uh, points. Anyway, uh, I don't want to take time from your coffee break. We can keep talking in the corridor. Thank you very much for all the questions. <laughs>